But if you have your Bible, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And let's read it in its entirety, verses 18 through 24. As this morning, I want to speak to you about the changing power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There our good brother Paul, through inspiration, records these words. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For the Jews request a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. As you begin to look at this passage, someone recently commented on a post online that they did not want to be part of a church that all that they had to offer was the gospel. There are so many in our world today who are focused on what I would term social things. They believe in all of the programs. As a matter of fact, I had a conversation years ago with a young couple. And they came in, and as they came in to visit with us, their first question was not, what are you preaching and teaching? It is, what programs do you have for my kids? Amen. And brethren, that is exact opposite of what I believe Scripture teaches. If we begin with teaching the simplicity of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it won't matter about our programs. It won't matter about all of our areas of work. Because in all of those areas, they will line up strictly to what God has asked us as members of His body to do. And so when you go back to this passage, we must understand that even in the days of the apostles, in the early stages of the church, not everyone appreciated the gospel. No. To some, it was foolishness. Yeah. But to others, we see, as those who were Christians, they began to value and to appreciate the simplistic gospel of Jesus Christ. Right. And so as I look this morning, what I want us to see is the power that the message of the gospel has to change people. Because I believe that the same gospel that changed those 3,000 souls on the day of Pentecost, when it says that they were cut in their heart and that they obeyed the gospel, I believe that same message of that day will change our world today. Amen. And so I want to share with you four ways in which the gospel changes people. And I may not read every scripture this morning. Hopefully the ones that I have chosen to support what I'm trying to say are ones that we would be familiar with. And so first of all this morning, the gospel has the power to change the spiritual condition of men and women. And very simply put, what I'm saying is that the gospel has the power to take one who is a lost sinner and transform them in to a saved saint. If you turn over just a few chapters in 1 Corinthians in chapter 6, as you read that, that passage in verse 9 down to verse 11, Paul speaks of some who were in Corinth that were sinners. And as you read that list, you will see he lists off things that we might see as being a, quote, major sinner. I don't believe there's any difference in any sin because it is one sin that will keep you out of heaven. 
But Paul lists off that there were some there who were idolaters, who were adulterers, who were fornicators, and so on and so forth. But when I come to verse 11, it says, And such were some of you. And at what point were they changed? When they obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was the gospel which took them from the state of being a lost sinner into one who was saved. You see, we are saved by the gospel. If it were not for the good news of Christ going to the cross and dying for our sins, we would all still be in that lost state. But as we look at what Paul says, or what the writer in Acts Luke reports for us, he speaks to us that we are cleansed through baptism. Particularly notice Acts 22 and verse 16 where Paul is telling of his own conversion. You remember he recounts the words of Ananias. And Ananias says, why are you waiting? Paul, if you know what you need to do to be saved, why are you waiting? And then Ananias gives him those wonderful words of encouragement when he says, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, yep. calling on the name of the Lord. Right. It is recorded for us that we go from this lost sinner to become a saved saint by the manner of baptism. You see... We go from being children of the devil to being the children of God. Paul in Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 and verse 27, where he speaks to us that as many of us have been baptized into Christ, what have we done? We have put on Christ. Brethren, first and foremost today, the gospel can change us in our spiritual condition. And that may be the most important thing that we see change is that transformation from one who is lost and dead in their sin to one who can be vibrant and alive through Christ. But secondly, this morning as I think about this changing power of the gospel, I see that it changes the outlook for men and for women. And as I speak of that, it is that which goes and leads us from a state of hopelessness to a state of hopefulness. And as you look at the passages that are listed there, go to Ephesians chapter 2 and look in verse 12. Paul again records for us these words. He says there that at times you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having what? No hope. Having no hope, and even worse, without having no hope, it says that you were without God. Brethren, you can go from hopelessness to hopefulness through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Or perhaps you need to go to 1 Peter chapter 1 and look at verse 3 where it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a, notice what it says, a living hope. How does that living hope come about? He said it is through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Amen. You and I can go from the helpless state to the, or excuse me, the hopeless state to the hopeful state because Jesus died for us. I want you to think of two instances here. I want you to think first of all about the Philippian jailer this morning in Acts chapter 16. Do you remember the Philippian jailer was given charge to guard Paul and Silas as they were in the midst of the inner part of the prison. Do you remember what happened that night? As Paul and Silas were singing, an earthquake overtook the area and opened all of the doors of the prison. Brethren, what was the jailer about to do? 
Do you remember he was about to take his own life? He was about to kill himself. Why? Because he knew that if one prisoner escaped, his life would be taken. Right. He was hopeless. Right. He was hopeless because he would have taken his own life and been without salvation. But you remember, in that passage, what happened? Paul cried out, didn't he? Do yourself no harm. Don't hurt yourself. And I'm sure the jailer was scratching his head saying, what do you mean don't hurt myself? I'm responsible. I'm going. That's how we would have reacted. Yep. But then Paul said some comforting words to that man. He says, for we are all here. No one has escaped. And so the jailer that very hour took Paul and Silas, he took them to his home, he treated their wounds, and Paul was able to do what for him? Was he not able to preach unto him Jesus Christ and him crucified? And the jailer and his household, what did they do? They obeyed the gospel. The jailer went from a state in which he was ready to say it's all over for me, hopeless, into a state of hopefulness because the Apostle Paul took time to teach him about Jesus Christ. Amen. And then you can even think back, if you will, if you want to just go back to the book of Romans and look at chapter 7. Notice verse 24 and verse 25. Paul himself, he speaks of his own life. Where in those verses he says, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Who's going to, to, to take me out of this hopeless state I'm in? And then he answers the question in verse 25 when he says, I thank God through, our, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with for the flesh the law of sin. Paul went from hopeless to hopeful because he turned to obedience of God's law. Oh, brethren, understand <coughs> something. It's not easy to go from a state of hopeless to a state of hopeful. But it can be done. That's right. Because no matter what we do, our physical body is still going to want to serve the flesh. Yes, it does. But we can serve the law of God without serving the flesh. But we also change our outlook. We change our outlook on life from that of a worldly outlook to a spiritual outlook. Notice what Paul says in Philippians chapter 3 as we begin to read there in verse 4. He says, Though I might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I am more so. And he lists off why he is confident in the flesh. I was circumcised the eighth day from the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, I was a Pharisee. Look what I was. Look where I was and the power and the prominence that I had as a human being. I was a religious man, what he says. Concerning zeal, he says, I persecuted the church. Concerning the righteousness which is the law, I was blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted for loss for Christ. Yeah. Paul says, it doesn't matter where I was. My outlook changed from this worldly outlook to a spiritual outlook because what of what Christ did for me. But indeed, I also count all things for loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. Paul says the things I've lost that's like the trash I take out to the curb every week. Paul says they weren't really anything. They were like the garbage that we throw away. Why could he say that? Because he changed his outlook on life from what was in the world to what was more important, and that was that spiritual side of life. Amen. 
but not only when we think of these outlooks changing, we also see that we go from one who changes from self-pity to righteousness. We see what Paul writes in Romans chapter 8 and in verse 18, where in that passage he says these things. He says, I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with what? With what is ahead. I, I, I can't count and think about the things of this world because <coughs> the things which are going to be revealed in the glory in the future, that's going to be much better than what this world has to offer. And so when you and I, sometimes when we throw ourselves a pity party and we think nothing else can go wrong and all of life has cast us a lot in which we pity ourselves, remember something. We ain't seen nothing yet. We have not seen what will be revealed to us. Amen. Brethren, I believe what the Bible says. When I turn to the book of Revelation and I read of what heaven will be like, when I read in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 4, that there'll be no more tears, that there'll be no more sickness, that there'll be no more dying, and all the things that John records for us, that picture is not really all there is that's going to be revealed. That gives me a glimpse, but I can't imagine it in my mind what it's going to be like. Right. But thirdly, this morning, the changing power of the gospel will change the lifestyle of men and women. First of all, it will change our religious lifestyle. We will go from one who is serving idols to the one who is going to serve God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 9 reveals. But I also understand that I can be like the Apostle Paul. I can go from being that fanatical persecutor through the precious proclaimer. I know that I can go and that I can change my life. I can go and preach and teach the message of the gospel. But I also know in my life religiously, I know that I go from one who is a vain worshiper into one who is a true worshiper. When I think of Matthew chapter 15 and verse 9, you remember the words of Jesus there. It says, in vain they worship me. What do they do? They take the commandments of men and try to make them the doctrine of God. I will go away from that idolistic worship and I will become one who Jesus reveals to the woman at the well in Samaria in John chapter 4 that says that they that worship God must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And the reason they do that is because God is a spirit. I know that my life religiously can be changed when I study the gospel of Jesus Christ. But secondly, when I think about changing the lifestyle, I also understand that it changes just the general life that I live. I go from one who is self-seeking where everything revolves around me to one who's in a state of self-denial. Isn't that what Jesus says as He delivers the Sermon on the Mount? Doesn't He tell us that we must go from being one who wants to be served to the one who is a servant? Where I also see that I transfer and I, trans, I, I, I change myself by getting away from the lusts of men to serving and doing the will of God. Not only do I do that, but I go from one who is lazy and I become one who is productive. And brethren, understand something. We all, when we become a member of the body of Christ, have a responsibility of being productive. Amen. Right. While we may have different roles, that doesn't relieve us 
from fulfilling what we are capable of doing. But lastly, this morning, when I think about the changing power of the gospel, I know for a fact, as it is revealed to me in Scripture, that it changes the destiny of men and women. When I go back and I look at 1 Thessalonians, and I look in chapter 1, and begin reading with me in verse uh, 7. And to give you who are troubled rest with us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God, and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Do you see what Paul says? Paul says there are those who when Christ comes again, the ones who did not know, and I want to focus this morning on the ones who knew but did not obey. Yep. And I focus on them because we have some here this morning who know the truth of the gospel. And I want you to go from this state of being eternally doomed into the state of being eternally saved. Because that's what the power of the gospel does. It translates us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. It moves us from a state in which we are lost into a state in which we are saved. <clears throat> because when the Lord comes, when the Lord comes, when your life is over, you have no hope to become a Christian. That's why the Scripture says, today is the day of salvation. You see, you go from one who is hell bound to one who is heaven bound. Amen. Brethren, I just scratched the surface of what the gospel can do in changing you and the power that it has. And so our question for you today as listeners is what are you going to do? What are you going to do in response to the invitation that the Lord has given you when He says, Come unto me, all ye who are weary and are heavy laden. You see, if you value the gospel, you'll want to obey the gospel. If you value the gospel as a Christian, you'll want to spread the gospel to those who are in need, just as you were in need. And then lastly, if you value the gospel, you'll defend the truth of it. This morning, we may have one who is here and not a member of the body of Christ. And you know what you need to do. You need to come out of an obedient heart, Amen. repenting with a determination in your mind. I want to change the way I live. I don't want to live the way of the world. I want to live the way of Christ. Amen. And you can confess His name as the Son of the living God, the one who gave His life for you to redeem you from your sin. And you can contact His blood in the watery grave of baptism as you go down into the water where His blood will wash away your sins. Right. And you rise out of that watery grave and you become a new creature walking in newness of life as we spoke of last week. But we also may have one here who has done that and you've put Christ on in baptism and yet for whatever the reason is you've turned your back on Him. Yep. And you need to come home because you knew God and now you've denied God. That's just as bad as never knowing Him. You can come home this morning repenting of sin, confessing those sins. Let your brethren pray with you, pray for you. Because remember, we're all here for one reason. And that is to help each other journey from the earthly land to the heavenly land. You know what your need is. All we ask is you make your need known by coming to the front as we stand and as we sing.